Well, welcome back to another edition of Cup Talk. I'm here with our Editor-in-Chief Emeritus, Bob Cohn. We're here to discuss issues of the day. You may be wondering why I'm wearing this t-shirt. It's for our Lighten Up Challenge, our collaboration with the uh, great folks at the Jewish Community Center. We're having a weight loss competition, and I'm part of it. And 50 teams have signed up, so we are thrilled about it. So. You don't have to move the table at us for it. <laughs> exactly. So, Bob, welcome. Glad to be here. Well, you wouldn't think so much could happen in a week or two uh, in Egypt. But as we uh, appear here today, which is Thursday the 10th, President Hosni Mubarak is teetering on resignation. The military is flexing its muscles and a new government could be imminent. What's your take on what's going on? Also, the labor unions have joined the uh, strike, public workers who had gotten a 15% raise. I was asked last night at a meeting what I thought the odds were of Mubarak hanging on it again this morning. And I think he still has about a 60% chance of making it, uh, at least technically, as president until sub the September elections. Mm -hmm. uh, it all depends on the tipping point will be if the army specifically chooses sides and goes with the protesters as opposed to the regime. And do you think Vice President Salani has a chance of becoming the, uh, the president? I actually am rooting for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he is well regarded by the U.S. intelligence and military establishments and also by Israel which may not help him with some of the more leftist elements of the protesters, mm -hmm. but he's considered a pretty good guy. Well, we'll keep watching because we know things are changing by the moment. Sure. Um, an article in the Jewish Forward um, uh, yesterday about challenges to the conservative and reform movements um, talks about a cadre of 17 reform rabbis from large congregations who are meeting kind of sub rosa to talk about uh, changes for the movement. And this comes at a time when many uh, congregations, both in, inside and outside Judaism, are analyzing this cost-benefit mm -hmm. equation of what they receive from their de denominations. What, what's the history on that, and what's your take on what's going on? Well, we've had uh, a history in our own community of people questioning their dues that they pay to their national organizations, mm -hmm. and, we'll quote, what do we get in return? I know that Central Reform Congregation considered actually disassociating from the reform movement and mm -hmm. there were some serious negotiations which were successful to keep them in the fold. But in t times of economic distress, both for the synagogues and temples as well as for individual members, uh, plus we're in kind of a post-denominational phase where among the younger rabbis you'll find at base A getting together uh, and, and not being wedded to a particular branch of Judaism. You know, uh, I hate to put in a shameless plug for the Jewish light, um, you know, but what, what we've said to advertisers during this very tough economic recession is, you know, you should keep advertising now because, you know, this is the time you need it because if you don't advertise now, you come back later, you'll have to start all over again. Isn't there an argument that at a time when the economy is weak and when there are challenges is the most important time for congregations to associate with a greater whole rather than looking at what the uh, precise dollars might be associated Absolutely. with. Absolutely, and, and the Jewish light really is the best way of getting to the largest segment of our Jewish community, both affiliated and non-affiliated. Mm -hmm. I once uh, saw a guy buying the Jewish light at World News, and he, I said, do you mind uh, telling me why you're buying that instead of getting it home? He says, well, uh, I am Jewish, I'm, my wife is not, but I still want to know what's going on in the community, and this way I can connect and still maintain my... And isn't that true of congregations, too? I mean, if people are wanting to talk about, you know, where do I go when I'm in St. Louis? Who do I talk to when I'm in St. Louis? You know, they're, not, they're just not randomly picking up the phone or emailing and finding, or searching on Google and finding a particular congregation. They're going to look to the national organization as a resource for that. Without question. No. So, um, let's talk about something very sad, the passing of Pretzel's Bakery. Um, yeah. This is, uh, as, as a lifelong uh, St. Louis Jewish native, yes. this has got to be near and dear to your heart. So what does this mean to you? I'm sure you and your Chicago background have parallel experiences with food places that you reminisce about. Whenever the guys at Pile and the Fly fraternity in Washington you may have had a few too many uh, beers at a fraternity party. At 3 in the morning, we would go to the Prassels on Eastgate. The back window would be open, and the steam with the aroma of those bagels would, would fill the alleyway. Uh, it was like going to a speakeasy, and we would fill up on bagels to absorb the excess alcohol. Plus, it, it really does. I, I was there the other day at Simon Cohn's, and I saw this little stuffed animal with prassels on its shirt and, and a, one lonely little holla. And it was very poignant, and I hope that some way will be found for that name to be uh, 
preserved, somebody maybe purchased the goodwill of Brassels for nearly a hundred years. And, and we're hearing, you know, on the street about forces swirling to see if if a kosher bakery can't be uh, brought into a new one can't be exactly. brought into place. Uh, speaking of the Pratzel situation, we had a letter this week about uh, in the paper about someone very sad about the passing of Pratzels, but but in writing, the writer used a metaphor uh, about remembering where they were when President Kennedy was assassinated wow. uh, to make the emotional comparison. Do you think that's fair to make such a comparison? And do you think it's appropriate for us to publish such a letter? Well, you know, in food terms, it, I can understand, I can relate to it. Maybe somebody picking it up from out of town say, "Well, you're comparing the tragic uh, taking down of a, a beloved president to the closing of a bakery." But if you're a St. Louis native and you really f feel for the passing of that great institution, uh, I can relate to it. From food to maybe my favorite thing in the world, uh, besides Judaism, of course, which is baseball. And uh, we're, of course, thrilled that a nice Jewish boy, David Cobb, has yes. been added to the 40-man roster of the St. Louis Cardinals. And we've had Jewish players on the Cardinals before, like Jason Marquis, uh, in recent years. Do uh, you think it's something special to the Jewish community to have a MTOB member of the tribe on our team? Well, especially when you're talking about the cop talk, to have a Jewish cop. <laughs> and one of the first art of the first Although art that's cop with two Ps. That's true. <laughs> we're not cop. Out. <laughs> <laughs> One pun leads to another. But Richie Scheinbloom was a Cardinal for the last year of his active Major League career. Mm -hmm. And David Makovsky, when he was an intern at Epstein Hebrew Academy, did his first article for the Jewish Light uh -huh. on him. Uh -huh. And I think it is, it's a matter of pride to have somebody, uh, you know, a member of the tribe, as you put it, as a member of the Cardinal Nation. I think it always enhances. Cool. Well, thank you, Bob, for that and for everything. And, uh, and thank you. And we'll be back soon with another edition of Cop Talk. Take care. Thanks.